Ara, wherein is a guinea a coat lorries, wheeled in a rock, the Sisaguni coat of fat, Erin Gettel, she has this mean them a week as a goal as act on Firkin Folger, a darsh of Romhain is Rema van Kele, Sivin is Nadini to a frustel, a lum is privileged venture, a rock called Kiluruk Marsha, as Muddick, Kilure Fehev Lener and Fold of Less and Commonly Less Less Gla Corsil and Coil Ayrakta. May I very begin, Chairman, by congratulating you on a, on a very fine uh, uh, speech. And I think it has benefited enormously from uh, its frankness. Uh, I think that I want very much to say, uh, Margaret Mehian, to all his adventure, can come over and fair have lean a bun and coil air at the Kalura. Agus a gum week as Kamalishin, Lishan Privithakak Famicon and Corlum to St. Michael Sterret, Lishan Kahilok to Hain, Agus even wheeled and bored, as sucked and quit a shawl's jit dum Hain tiocked. I'm so pleased that uh, to have received this invitation uh, to come along and celebrate with you uh, 20 years of the foundation uh, of the Heritage Council. Uh, I, I do think that it is absolutely wonderful to see so many representatives of community groups drawn from different parts of our island gathered here. I also was so impressed to see the different publications that are there on different aspects of the heritage and all of the groups in the different parts of circumstances of our living together who are uh, working in this area. For example, the islands, people interested in biodiversity, so many different, uh, so many different areas. It has been uh, a fruitful 20 years. Uh, it has, uh, so much uh, has been achieved. I listened with great care what you had to say, Chairman, and I very much take up these challenges. I think we wouldn't have had a council 20 years ago if there hadn't been uh, some frank speech uh, in relation to the importance of heritage, August um, Kursi uh, and I think I want to say as well, it's wonderful to to have had the opportunity of meeting some former council members, some of whom I appointed to the very first board when I served as Minister for Arts, Culture and the Gertart, and Alien Kultur I was so pleased as well to to meet the daughter of Frida Roundtree who I remember uh, was uh, such a wonderful opening chair of the Heritage Council. Uh, to give you an atmosphere at the time, uh, when Frida was appointed by me, along with other chairs to different bodies which had responsibility, some people said, uh, Frida who? Well, they very quickly found out, and it was, it was a person who had the deepest commitment, um, the deepest commitment to, to heritage, you understood it. At our very first meeting in Mespel Road, I recall her saying, how are we to establish our independence from you, Minister? And I said, you must be independent, you just go ahead first, and we'll see how it all gets on. Uh, I think her tragic death in, in the year 2000 uh, was something that uh, I, I've heard with great sorrow. And more than today, I have to say as well, I heard with great sorrow uh, a, f a few days ago of the passing of the grandson of Michael Killanen, who was of such enormous uh, young man uh, on a trip to the South America. And I have to say, Lord Killanen uh, was somebody who was extraordinarily helpful in the, the transition from the pre-statutory existence to the statutory existence. And there were those as well who uh, are now in retirement who, were, who had uh, advised myself. It was one of my privileges as the, the minister to introduce the bill that became the Heritage Act in 1995 and which established, its, which established the Heritage Council on Korla Ayrakta. The non-statutory Heritage Council had been established in 1988 and Michael Killanen had chaired it and it had laid a very important groundwork. But it was a matter of principle for me and for many others at the time that the Council be placed on a statutory footing so as to strengthen its role, indeed as you Chairman say, in identifying, protecting, promoting, preserving and enhancing Ireland's heritage in facilitating its appreciation and enjoyment 
and getting the balance between the two parts of the sentence right was very quickly controversial and also in informing our approach to managing this national resource. The bringing into existence of a set of statutory heritage provisions and institutions was not without its controversies. I recall that at the time I felt it necessary to state that the word heritage had become somewhat devalued in usage and by association uh, with a cliched image of what it was assumed visitors to Ireland wanted to see. It was a case of rattling the bag of scenery. Uh, and occasionally this occurs in relation to uh, inclinations to, for example, applying such a view to, to culture. But that kind of utilitarian reductionism was, I believed then, I believe now, and I remained totally convinced of it, was both blinkered and myopic. And it didn't describe sufficient recognition or importance to much of our natural built and cultural capital. I've always preferred, and I repeat it now, I said it in 1995, I've much preferred the Irish word Iroch to the word heritage. I have always felt that the word heritage was limited to a certain extent uh, by scholarly circumstance. And there's a great ring to the word Iroch. It goes back farther, and it goes farther in imaginative terms, as we would say in Irish, in Saliach. I think that it totally, too, it captures the totality of our heritage, built and natural. And that was the discussion at the time, the built and natural heritage of Ireland, for which the Coal Iraq of the Heritage Council was established to help us to appreciate and protect. I remember very early on uh, some of the very early controversies in which we were involved. To make the statement that the heritage of Ireland belongs to the people of Ireland in perpetuity, lifted it out of the obligations and responsibilities of a single generation and forwarded it into future generations to come. There are practical sides to this. It arose very early on, for example, in the abandonment, the making illegal of the concept of treasure trove, uh, which I can assure you that decision didn't fall out of the sky. And there were those who had bits and pieces of the heritage which they would have liked to sell to the representatives of the people as the state. I remember one of the conversations on one of these occasions where I was saying, you may be, compensa you may be re rewarded for good citizenship, but you must never imagine for a second you own anything that belongs to the people in perpetuity. I was reminded recently in my visit to Cork in association with the commemoration of the sinking of the Lusitania of these issues of property and issues of heritage and so forth. And I must say that I was very pleased to have made the Marine Heritage Order I made on that occasion, and I've never regretted that either. But I think when I was introducing it, if I can be helpful to you, back 20 years ago, it was my hope that we as a nation would re-engage and rethink what heritage means in that general sense that I mean, as a form of identity inherited, but also in the process of continuous reimagining as a component of identity. Because people don't compose either their imaginations or their identity in terms of material fact only. It's a good time to bear this in mind as we celebrate the 150 years of the birth of William Butler Yeats, for example. Taking the word in its widest sense, heritage, if I use it for the sake of convenience, or Irish, which I would like to use, it can be said to embrace all those elements of Irish life which we've inherited from the generations gone before, but also the continuing survival into the future. It depends on the attitudes and actions of the present. And certainly some of the most moving things I've seen as I came in was a very, very successful schools programme and the reception and welcome that there is for it among young, among young children. Over the last two decades, our concept of the word heritage has evolved somewhat, and now the concept includes not only the tangible heritage we might have debated in the uh, 20 years ago, but also elements, as I've said, of our intangible living heritage, such as songs, poems, and language. And when we speak of heritage today, we're talking about our interaction with the world around us, both real and abstract, 
our identity and our need to tell our own story in our own way and to respect the different versions of the use of story in the past. I think that is very, very interesting as well. For example, so many of you drew are better qualified than I to actually look at the recomposition of very ancient mythic tales in the pre-Christian period and their adaptation, or even in the pre-Bible period, and their adaptation uh, to new circumstances. All of this is important in all of its aspects. I do appeal to you, Minister, to convey to government of the importance of all of this. We should not have the debates that we had 20 years ago. I, I would be dishonest if I said any of it was easy. It was not easy, and I'll come to that in a moment. But we are now in a position where, after coming out of a period of hubris of excess and a certain amount of Philistinism, where we must really go back and recover the best of all of those moments and our aspirations of 20 years ago and recraft a new decade of action into which we can move uh, with positive, achievable and really far more inclusive and enjoyable concepts. I think when we speak, uh, uh, when remain, we can be true to the original objectives that were set out in that founding year 20 years ago. But I think you have been challenged, and you have met the challenge in embracing a more inclusive agenda in difficult times. You are right to speak, very frankly, Chairman, of what it is necessary to do. Uh, if you say, if we have come over 20 years to now recognise the importance of what, have been, of what you've been speaking about and what I've been speaking about, it's important that we make provision for it. For the dedicated and the committed, it has not been easy. All those years ago, I saw what we were planning as simply a commencement. And I'm very frank, I often discussed it with Michael Killernan, a commencement from an unacceptably low base. You couldn't say that it, we had uh, some enlightenment to drop from the sky. It was a low base, and we were to encounter. Um, people sometimes think, do I imagine all this? Oh, no, because I can remember uh, the Dublin dangerous build, the dangerous building section of Dublin Corporation. Uh, I remember quite as well having to retain the services of senior counsel for that extraordinary week in the Irish year between Ash Wednesday and the Wednesday after Easter, when about 80% of the illegal demolitions would take place. This, in a way, is very important to say. If we have, in fact, and if you have achieved very much, it's important that we realise now the new challenges that are there. I think in the short time that is available to me today, I couldn't adequately deal with the role that the Heritage Council has, placed, has played over the last two decades, but I do want to mention some specific initiatives that really are your successes. Uh, I think in, in lodging uh, the awareness of, of heritage among the public, Heritage Week, the Council's role in developing Heritage Week, has been a great success. And it has been wonderful to involve communities in celebration of what they value and hold in common. Last year, 1,700 events took place across the country involving an exploration of wildlife, folklore, genealogy, historic buildings, gardens and local history. But of course, the challenge is now, as you have said, to build on this public support and graft its policy into academic work and actually to build even more durable bridges between academic work policy formation and this work of, of, of communities. There is a very old thing in, 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 in the Irish mind anyway, which is to do with Shamakas. But beyond that, the impulse to tracing, the importance of place. And then I think as well, what will be then the next decades as well, the kind of democratisation of heritage. That if you like, that everything that was ever made, or made sought to be beautiful, by a person in any circumstance, is something that is important. The inclusiveness of a redefined heritage is very, very important. And certainly your heritage and school scheme, in that regard, is a very important initiative. It is a very interesting thing about how the life of Ireland would change if there was one beautiful object in every house. More than there are different small things that matter. But the recognition of what is, of, of what is made and it also experienced that, for example, said that the built and natural heritage, the whole importance of respecting diversity, which we saw in the exhibition uh, as well. 
and of building it into, if you like, of realizing that it is different forms of economic structure that must give way if we are to have a holistic approach towards how we live together, which would have a heritage component. This will never be easy, Chairman, may I tell you. Uh, I would be quite, again, dishonest if I didn't say the deep depression that I had at how the different structures that I left in place in the 1990s uh, were abandoned or changed. And changed not necessarily for any reasons that the proposals I had, which might have been beginning ones, uh, were, were being transcended by better ones. They were as much wrecked because of institutional jealousies and backward thinking and lazy thinking than anything else, quite frankly. I was very pleased, therefore, that in the future children will protect when you go forward in relation to heritage policy. 900 schools taking part in the heritage and school scheme is a very, very great involvement. I think the passing on of Tavok Nahirata does the gloom to a child chiocht. The joy of passing on this knowledge to the young is that they gain an appreciation of what our generation and those that went before us held to be important. It is perhaps opens up to the possibility of younger minds recognising value in our heritage where we failed to see it. I think that is important because there are new dimensions of heritage in relation to forms of, of, of forms of artifact, forms also of practice in relation uh, to farming, in relation to living, in relation to, uh, like Dr. Milan's work, in relation to the Tatch, for example. There are so many new pieces and possibilities now that can be added in. Uh, that can be added in. Then again, the Irish Wall Towns Network founded by the council in 2005, is yet another scheme that has had important benefits in that it has ensured that Ireland's unique walled and fortified towns and cities are protected and managed in a sustainable and appropriate manner in the long term. I should tell you, I was exchanging with you, Chairman, of my conversations with your late uncle, Etienne Wren, in relation to the town of Athenry where it was necessary to serve food. The idea where it was assumed by those who in fact claimed authority in a community, that you could just knock a hole in the wall and to extend the car park of the church. Uh, I, I, so again, uh, well, I say these things not in any bitter sense, but only to say you have to know what you're dealing with. Yes, I wish you well in relation to all that will be possible now, but don't imagine for a second uh, that there aren't... Uh, atmospheres around and policies around and attitudes around uh, which maybe they're not representing the best that we took from ourselves in relation to thinking that you can do anything you like. What I just call at that time, I remember talking to people down the country as the don't hold me back syndrome which in the Irish novel is the notion of the far more and what this country is needed is someone with a fine Philistine origin him or her and that they'll bring us all up. I think there's a long distance between these attitudes and, for example, the National Biodiversity Data Centre, the Irish National Strategic Archaeological Research Programme, the wonderful Discovery Programme, whose publications are so important, the High Nature Value Farming Programme, and the Museum Standards Programme. These are all wonderful, wonderful, and I urge the Minister to ensure that government brings the, them into the heart of what it is planning. And government, too, needs to look, if you like, the reform of its entire planning process so that what it's doing with its right hand is not contradicted by its left hand. And I'm delighted that there are now 86 heritage officers and so on, but I remember their arrival on the scene and their establishment. And I remember how, if you like, their existence had to be negotiated within the atmospheres of city halls and town halls and county council buildings. And this nonsense that we went through, remember, in relation to arts officers who were coming about at the same time, and the long and tedious discussions, not gone yet from the corpse of our administration, sometimes that is the public world in Ireland, to whom will they be reporting? Will it be the county engineer, the county manager? Will it be the accountant? Will it be the county secretary and so on? And did any of it matter? 
And what about the beauty that was being threatened and all of so? And that's what you must put an end to. And really, I think it's very, very important that the next decades, you shouldn't have to repeat all the founding obstacles and all of the obstacles that are there all along the way. And it's necessary to have courage, as indeed you have by speaking frankly. And it's necessary as well to realise that you may have to do new things. You may have to be clever. You may have to take an inventory of all the talent that is within the council and the practitioners among the 86 people and seek to publish their work if no one else does so. I think that the council support that I looked at on my way in, such as the Bear Island Projects Group, wonderful, the Boron Bio Trust, the Wicklow Uplands Council and the Woodlands of Ireland, they've been very important in protecting and managing unique elements of our diverse landscape as well as contributing to, and they do, they contribute to job creation and sustainability. I saw an article in the paper that had an extraordinary headline that Ireland had the most over educated young people in Europe. It really stunned me for at least a few minutes as to how you could be over educated. I think, in a way, what it was, it was a kind of, in a way, you come into that if you're looking at the tail end of utilitarian thinking. It was rather like a generation wasn't making itself useful. I think that it's very important that we respect scholarship and respect also the importance of all the work that is being done and by these projects that I mentioned. The Irish landscape is, of course, clothed in a rich heritage of monuments. They're Toshit and Tovartak. History, mythology, folklore and place names. Sometimes one weeps for the several translations of the place names, Loganavtairn, with one sometimes beautiful names that described a natural piece of complexity translated into English and then translated back into again into something that isn't a language at all. <laughs> I think that it is uh, uh, I I also think as well, and I wish you courage, beg on mission Octavertok. And that is in relation to places of natural diversity and fragility, such as mountains, bogs, plains, rivers, lakes, and the coast that have historical, religious, mythological, and legendary associations. I remember attending very dramatic meetings, meetings attended by hundreds of people who felt that there should be an infinite number of sheep that you could have on mountains. And remember saying to them once, they said to us, what says, we have 40, we have 200 people here tonight. We'll have 2,000 next week. And I said to them, well, you can keep adding notes to it, but you're not improving your argument. But, whereupon there was sustained booing for 10 minutes. Now, I say this to tell you that the fact that we have a heritage council the fact that we have sensitivity to the heritage did not fall from the sky, nor is it a natural accompaniment of forms of economic life that have prevailed and been hegemonic in rural and urban Ireland. These resonances of the past that I refer to are part of our cultural heritage. What I've just been referring to in the natural complex is these are complex ecosystems of which we as living, as, as forms of life, are put apart, but upon which we all depend. And I think that we will all gain from looking at these exhibitions, from the children now have access to them, a whole new language that is able to handle biodiversity, natural complexity and ecosystems. And I think that will that is very important as we try to fathom the importance of natural systems to our own well-being and to understand the implications of losing the natural balance in our climate system and our biosphere. And you referred, Chairman, as well, to, in fact, in relation to the convention that's sourced in the Council of Europe. One of the great lessons, if people should bear in mind in the public world, is to contrast the thinking that led to that convention within the Council of Europe and the absolute failure at the level of the European Union to develop anything equivalent. It is at the level of the European Union a, compl a failure in the general area of culture and specific failures in relation to some of these dimensions of within culture. They couldn't even recognise the area, nor to speak of having measures that would be adequate measures. Then returning home, there are countless historical buildings, traditional structures, places of worship, and other elements of our material heritage whose conservation and repair has been supported by the Heritage Council over the years. 
I remember in the years that followed the establishment of the legislation being in places like Castletown and elsewhere. And I point out that just in the same way as the occupants of the houses whose figures, whose ancestors are in the portraits are important, so also is the careful work of the stonemasons and all of those with all the different skills who contributed to the creation of what is, after all, a shared heritage. Many of the conservation projects that you have assisted in the two, in the two decades have had marvellous community implications and connections and cooperations, bringing local groups together with local heritage societies, preservation societies. And what they've done is something that is very important. They have restored people a sense of place, a pride of place, and from that pride of place comes a genuine care that is beyond the personal aggrandizement. I think over the last two decades, yes, our Irish society has been changing. And through that period in Corla, Irish has also changed, along new kinds of partners. And you have been seeking, and they have, to develop a comprehensive community-based heritage infrastructure, which is the centre point of your speech, Chairman. <laughs> I think that's very important to support and promote heritage at the local level. And it is important that in the future, something that was very difficult <coughs> is to have an integrated approach that offers a connection between what people are trying to do and place, and that offers, it offers benefits of enabling and empowering local communities to use heritage to improve their sense of well-being and quality of life. One should be doing it for oneself because it is, in fact, improves the quality of life of the community. And the way it works best, then, is that tourists are not people, in fact, that you're shaking down, but they are, in fact, visitors who you are welcoming within the moral norm of hospitality, and you have the confidence of sharing what you have valued in its both its beauty and in its humility. And in this regard, then, I pay tribute to all the local heritage officers who've been fundamental in fostering this dynamic network. And my wish for them is that when eventually we take up the challenge of local government reform in a meaningful way, that their role will be centrally recognised. That role is defined, in my view, with an institutional structure that merits review in terms of its integrative capacity. So many things are dying in Ireland because of dead, dead notions of hierarchy and often patriarchy. And it is almost impossible to, in fact, almost as if one was putting a wedge in a block to put in something new and creative into a system that isn't, in fact, conducive towards doing so. I wish you well in that. There is much then to celebrate after 20 years. But much more importantly... It is time to take stock and make a reflection on where those hopes and vision of 1995 might not have been fully realised. And when I went back over the Dole and Shannon debates from that time when I was steering the bill through the houses in 94 and 95, it was clear that the Heritage Council that I had envisaged and discussed as the founding minister was to be one part of a much larger design to promote, protect, realise the potential of various strands of our heritage. And that is why I have to say to you, as the person who was responsible for introducing that legislation, that I never sought in isolation. It went together with the National Monuments Acts, the National Cultural Institutions Acts, and the changes which I was proposing to the Wildlife Acts. That is if you were to be able to deal with the entire area comprehensively. People would say in the media at the time, he's building an empire. Yes, it was necessary, in fact, actually, to be able to speak meaningfully about this area at all. I think if one wanted to give effect to the Habitats Directive, all these things, all these elements taken together were key pillars of a comprehensive legislative framework for heritage protection. And it is important that where demolition of these integrative structures have taken place, that you press for them publicly if you want, in fact, a policy that will serve you well in decades to come. It was envisaged that the Heritage Council would provide a central policy advisory and coordinating role across all elements of government, and that heritage protection would find its appropriate expression across laws and policies governing each of the relevant sectors, particularly in those areas that presented threats to our heritage. 
a mechanism was in place that where, for example, a minister with responsibility for planning was in conflict with the minister with responsibility for the heritage, it would be resolved back in cabinet to try and resolve the dispute between the ministers. All of that, there was a retreat from it, which I really cannot say that I welcomed. And while there has been some notable success in having certain heritage protection functions delivered in sectoral legislation and policy making, other sectors remain in need of far more work. For example, we should not forget that despite 20 years of effort, the status of many of our protected natural habitats and species continues to deteriorate. And it would be unfair, and I'm not doing so, laying responsibility for this at the door of the Heritage Council, but it remains a shared challenge which I must address, in which the Council has a role. And I'm well aware that many of the institutional pieces I put in place, as I've said, were reframed with departmental changes in government administration after I left office. Now I just simply reflect on these and I leave it to the citizenry to decide what they think is appropriate into the future. Is minlam kubla fakloronish fingrelia, agas a hoit in our guivna model of course yarata. Darlam hain is gnelar naki and tiang in our nairak, nak fetilin as nar court on skarok nehiyelia. Agas a famlam lenta, na milta blian, is yan grelia, an man trinar kuig erinig in lekna le dimplak. Agas an kisht an avorshid na fakla, agas nahana kun karshisiana, er kursi polichok the creative nador of his culture. This Irish language that I have been speaking, a language that is so many thousand years older than Christianity itself, it is a constant thread running through almost all aspects of our heritage. And it cannot be disaggregated from how, for millennia, the Irish people related, they related to, interpreted, and shaped their and our world, and made their gods and replaced them, and adapted them. Place names, folklore, literature, the natural world, culture, social customs, politics, religion, all of these were contemplated and explored through the prism of Irish. The continuation of the spoken language is therefore a key component of our efforts to understand and protect our heritage. Yet, so often, when we talk about heritage, the spoken language sometimes seems to be a part, or somehow niche, rather than an integral part of our heritage in all its aspects. I believe that the Heritage Council and Cola Ayrath is well placed to bring this awareness and appreciation to a wider audience. And I would encourage it to redouble its efforts in this regard, particularly as we continue through the centenary of commemorations of the events that led to the foundation of the state. And returning to our recent past, Chairman, you have referred to something interesting. It has not been an easy journey for you, the Heritage Council. It has had to contend not only with the difficulties that I've mentioned, but also with the extraordinary hubris the impatient and heritage-threatening hubris of the Celtic Tiger years and the harsh realities of Ireland post-2008. You are right, in fact, to ask for content and to contest the meaning of austerity. If one is, in fact, spending less and so forth, what is it that is so valuable that you cannot afford to let it go? These are matters for government. But neither of those contexts, the hubris of the Celtic Tiger with its accompanying Philistinism, the utilitarianism that made it possible, and then the harsh utilitarianism that is dealing with its adjustment, I think that neither of these contexts were conducive to measured consideration of the value of heritage protection, particularly where the, the narrow metrics of pounds, shillings and pence or jobs were offered as a counter-argument. This is a false that was always, is now and will ever be, a false and dangerous dichotomy of choice. So influencing public policy must, in my view, become a more central aim of the Heritage Council as it embarks on its third decade and carries on through the other decades. And it may require a newly crafted relationship, not only with those departments and agencies directly involved with heritage policy, but also with those whose areas of responsibility have most impact on the future safeguarding of our heritage. It will require a new definition at European and national level of what are to be shared responsibilities and opportunities. Seeing heritage as an important and equal element of infrastructural planning, for example, that, frankly, still remains as an ambition rather than as a general achievement. 
And the council too, as you have said, has had to adjust itself to straightened times and the importance of trying to make effective use of what are far too limited resources in these new circumstances. That has brought everything into focus. I wish you well in the public debate on that, and I'm sure that all of those present will want to influence that. But I think in the future, the Council must be creative and imaginative in crafting new uses of its funds. It must seek to draw on the now public support it has, the community connections that it has, and where appropriate, find other resources to fulfil its mandate. The Heritage Council example, for example, in Burren Bio, is an excellent example of a collaboration which combines community, educational and indeed commercial benefits and outcomes. And in this way it helps to underpin the importance of protecting the ecological, archaeological and and cultural heritage uh, of the area. To maintain widespread support, It is vital that funding assistance that it can offer is distributed by the Heritage Council in a transparent way, consistent with a strategic vision. I suggest that it is important to say we would be doing this if we had funding and so on. And then doing what one is doing, saying we are doing this as a lesser version of what all our instincts tell us to do. I think there's great advantage in garnering public support by being so forthright. I think the Council has been successful in helping to build a community infrastructure that enhances awareness of our heritage. And I'm very heartened, Chairman, and enthused by the Council's ambition to build upon those foundations you now have and to maximise the support of communities in bringing heritage issues to the fore throughout Ireland. The Heritage Council's experience in engaging and encouraging community involvement will be a crucial factor in its success. And I know that in Cor You have mentioned it in your speech, Chairman, about the importance of the future of towns and villages in rural Ireland and how heritage can function as an agent of social cohesion and as a catalyst for sustainable and creative living. I think your own award-winning community-led village design statement initiative has sought to give a voice to village communities and strengthen the overall concept of community-led planning, heritage management and sustainability. I say everything I've said so far positively because I believe it can all be changed and there isn't any sense of laying blame where things are. It is rather saying what one must do next. What can one do best next and most urgently and practically? And I would urge the Council to reflect on a debate that is now opening up on the importance of the public space in our heritage and in our futures. By this I mean the importance of public spaces, such as parks and squares and walks, public buildings such as libraries, concerts, churches, halls, theatres, festivals, markets even. These are all key elements of our heritage. People talking, living, conversing together, rowing together if necessary, but in the public world. But one of the things that was a reverse after all of the time when I was there has been the consistent opposition to the public world since the end of the 1980s and an even deeper ideologically driven opposition to the role of the state in defending the public world, which is just so important. The concept of the shared space of the public world, the role of the local and national state, That has been under attack across Europe since the end of the 1980s and with disastrous results, leaving in the great cities of Europe gated communities on the one hand and ghettos on the other, where fear has replaced any sense of a shared sense of joy in the public space. Can an Irish the Hurtish Stocks of Fubble or can a Fubble Irish Sikospor Irish? Lilina Trifta Dulhanak, a river in Aig Hurtari Legionis Atisha, but Vishnu Lekol, got fast led Hishk and the Lini and the Kunkipa, either Rail for a show. I can say Moguig again token caller, Snefiblina Toruing make rule nis, Avar Hagas nis Larni, again Irish a sucky. She agony at all the heric fossex of forbert, as come a ram or a river shiv, egg car cloth, saul, yuk, mishnul of vine. And for those 
who are not familiar with Irish, my wish for you is that the Heritage Council, which has achieved much in making heritage part of the community and the community part of our heritage framework during those recent challenges to which you, Chairman, and I have referred, it is encouraging to see that people have developed in the throes of that a deeper appreciation and knowledge of the interrelated concepts that make up our heritage. And my sincerest wish is that the Council will, over the next 20 years and the coming decades, ensure that the role of heritage in the community becomes ever more relevant and central to our ever-changing and evolving society. That all of the necessary contributory and supportive changes will take place institutionally, at home and in Europe and abroad and that you will go on to a great successes in a bold and imaginative way. And my wish for you is be sauliak, be imaginative. And I congratulate the Council thus on this significant milestone, and I wish it every success going forward. And I thank you for allowing me the opportunity of being with you at Anakot Kilyuraksha on this great celebratory, important and auspicious, but as I would say, beginning occasion as we continue the work in a new way. Goramila Mahak.